uh, hopefully we have some more people joining us uh, since we just finished our major symposium on infections. So we have, um, yeah, next slide, next slide. So today's IC is on optimal usage of microbiology laboratory for ocular infections. And these are all the speakers, and I thank the speakers for accepting my invitation to be part of this IC. So the first talk is um, just a little bit change in the order of the talk. So Dr. Revati, who's a cornea consultant and head of cornea in um, Arvind Eye Hospital, Coimbatore, she'll be talking on management of culture-negative uh, corneal ulcers. And uh, then we'll go in, of course, for the utility of cultures in our uh, ophthalmic practice. So if you see, even in the best labs, we can get the um, culture positivity in about 60 to 70 percent of cases. And how we are managing the next uh, 30 percent of each of the cases, of course, we have to manage them only with our clinical uh, uh, equipment. And of course, we can get clues uh, from the clinical um, examination and also from the smear reports, not only the culture, and also other investigational methods sometimes we can use if, it, if they are available and suitable. And then, of course, by the clinical assessment of the response um, with which we can manage, we can plan our treatment, empirical treatment. And also we should uh, think why the culture is negative. In the, even in the first attempt, we took it negative. We should try further. We should not just leave it as culture negative. Anyway, all the cultures are negative only. How I am going to manage, not like that. So to first to see how we can do it clinically, we first we should have some knowledge what are the common pathogens in our region. So region to region it can vary. So we should have some knowledge about it so that that will give an idea what infection it could be. Then of course the other uh, signs and symptoms we have to look in. And especially some of the predisposing factors will have some kind of a uh, clue. It will give like what infection it could be. We all know these things, agricultural in, uh, product injuries, mostly fungal and dry soil injuries. It could be nocardia. In case of uh, pseudomonas, it can be a contaminated eye drop or uh, other foreign bodies removal uh, in, a, in, in a unhygienic way or contact lens associated. In acanthal viva, we should remember in India, the CL-related infections are very rare. But very common is wet soil, like in a construction or plantation workers and swimming pool related. And in compromised corneas, the infection usually will be gram-positive infections. And coming to the clinical features, we need not think that these pictures are only in the textbooks. We can see them day to day in our practice, but we should pay attention and we have to have some kind of an, a little bit of imagination to fit them into which category it can be, which clinical picture, and we can um, identify the organism to a certain extent. So in fungus, all these are our own patients, nothing is from the textbook or anything. We can see all these kind of pictures. And in case of uh, uh, pneumococcal, we can see the actual leading edge as a septiginous uh, ulcer. And in case of um, pseudomonas, we can see the typical melt with the greenish pus. And in case of nocardia, we can see the uh, string of pearls appearance or read. Maybe it may not be so good as the second picture, but it can be sometimes we have to imagine these dots, so it, it could be nocardia like that. And in case of acanthamoeba, of course, even from perineuritis, we can catch if we are very observant. And in case of uh, this um, atypical mycobacteria, a typical that spoke-like edges, if we can observe, and especially near a, a surgical wound, it could be no, uh, atypical mycobacteria. And coming to the smear study, of course, I feel like all ophthalmologists should be trying to do some basic smear studies before going for a culture uh, this thing. At least in KOH, we can almost we can find out uh, fungus, uh, nocardial filament, uh, canthabiba cysts, all these things we can find out in KOH itself. And coming to grams, almost everything can be covered in grams. And many times the smear itself can give you a good re uh, idea. And in case of if the culture become negative, we have to think why, like what I can do next. If it is a deep infection, we can go for a corneal biopsy. 
uh, from where we can take the specimen, we can do HPE also as well as the culture. And in such a infection, if the culture become negative, something is wrong. So better to go for a washout period, stop the treatment for a day, and then re-scrape uh, and go for the culture. And in case of if the facility is available, you can go for confocal, which can identify the acatomibasis, microsporidiosis, fungal filaments, and even nocardial filaments. And in case of then, we can go for the empirical therapy. In if we are strongly suspecting fungal infection, then we can go for natamycin as the first line, either monotherapy or with one of the zone. And we can assess the response for by a week, and then we can accordingly we can go ahead. And in cases where the infection is little bit deep and severe, we can go for even intrastromal in injections also of voriconazole. And one thing what we should remember in case of fungal infection or acanthamoeba or nocardial infection, we can't expect an immediate response. So if the response is not there within a week, we need not get uh, like jittery and we need not think it could be something else and all. Like we can continue as long as there are some signs of healing, we can still continue the treatment. And in case of ba bacterial infection, of course, we have to go for a broad spectrum coverage. Fluoroquinolones, monotherapy only for smaller uh, infections. But a little moderate to uh, higher uh, severe infections, better to go for fortified antibiotic coverage. And the loading dose is one thing which can be very useful even in the clinical setup. Uh, we can keep the patient for half an hour or one hour, uh, do the loading dose, then send them back home for the um, application at home. And in case of non-healing, we need not immediately think it could be we are missing out an infection. It can be the infection is controlled. It can be due to other reasons to find out whether it is neurotrophic or is it drug-related, drug toxicity. We have to titrate the drugs, and those things we have to uh, address. And also we should keep in mind some organisms are very difficult to cultivate in the culture, so we should keep in mind those infections also, and uh, accordingly we have to manage these patients. And also we have to remember non-infective uh, ulcers, like neurotrophic or rheumatoid-related melt, or this is a beast thing, which is sitting there with a necrotic um, surrounding, which, which is not infective, it's mainly immunological, and of course our staphylococcal infection, um, marginal keratitis. And once the, uh, after we titrate our um, medical therapy, if the response is not good, especially in case of chronic infections, we can go for even lamellar keratoplasty so that we can reduce the infection load and manage further. And if the infection is relentlessly progressive like this, or if they present like this, there is, uh, I mean, no point in waiting for the medical therapy to take effect further, better to go for a surgical intervention immediately. So the flow chart will be like, if the patient comes to you without any treatment, first uh, rule out any non-microbiological disease, then go for a corneal scrape, culture, and smear. And if there is organism seen, accordingly we can treat. If the culture is negative also, continue like whatever treatment, according to the response we can decide if the uh, uh, thing, uh, response is not good, we have to stop the, I mean, we can go for the, uh, stop that whatever treatment we are giving, go for the culture. And if the patient comes with the treatment, and uh, one more additional step we can assess, if the patient comes with a particular medication and already shows signs of healing, we need not jump in and change the medication, we can even continue and uh, see. And otherwise, we can, again, still we can do the culture because even with that medication, the patient is still having active ulcer, so we can go for the culture. If it is negative, stop the treatment, give the washout period, and rescrape and go. And even by the time we are waiting, anyway, we are going to start our treatment empirically based on clinical re uh, impression and clinical response from the previous treatment. And if necessary, we can we have to go for biopsy and the other, um, of course, whenever necessary, we can go in for a penetrating or a lamellar keratoplasty, which will again provide the material for further um, culture, uh, microbiological workup. So just to share uh, um, shortly, like this is the poster we put in the last EU cornea. We analyzed the outcome roughly retrospectively in the culture positive and culture negative cases. And uh, surprisingly, like uh, in 26 percent of the culture positive patients went in for TKP compared to only 14 percent of the culture negative uh, infections. And even the uh, culture of the button, what we have, which has been removed by the lamella, by the keratoplasty, again in one percent of the percent pa patients only in both groups, the our impression or whatever initially identified was different. Mostly, even especially in 38 percent of the 
patients with the culture negativity, our cl clinical impression was proved. And in another 60, it still remained negative. Probably HPA would have given better idea. And so it's like we concluded like this. Just because it is culture positive, we cannot take it like, okay, I know the organism, definitely I will be able to heal this ulcer. A clue may be, even after a previous treatment, the organism is still alive. That means it may be a virulent uh, infection. Probably it might need a surgical intervention more than a culture negative infection, which probably a low virulent one. That's what we um, assumed from this, uh, whatever our retrospective analysis. Thank you. Yes, uh, she'll be leaving. She has another talk. So clinically, as I show that uh, if it is a little advanced infection, we can see the spoke-like edges. And um, another one, usually it will be associated with a surgical wound or a trauma, that wound. That is another uh, clue clinically what we used to take. Yeah, yes, the, uh, these infections, of course, we, we have to include um, uh, the Kenyon's method uh, or veil lensons uh, technique and um, the LJ medium. When you suspect that kind of an infection, we have to ask the microbiology, tell the lab to do these tests also. Uh, because any gram-positive bacilli should always be ruled out for atypical. So even if it shows gram-positive bacilli and gram stain, we'll do an additional 1% AFB and rule out uh, atypical mycobacterium. Thank you, Dr. Devaki. That was a very interesting talk, especially your uh, analysis. Uh, good morning once again. And I thank the people who have uh, really found it interesting to come and attend our uh, IC. So I'll be, uh, I'm basically a microbiologist working at Arvinde Hospital. Uh, I do a little bit of clinical work, but most of my time is in the lab. So I, I really, the focus of my talk was um, uh, know, to really make the clinicians understand how optimally to make use of the lab and what and all are the steps as an ophthalmologist dealing with ocular infections, what should be done to ma have the maximum outcome from the laboratory. So my talk is on two parts, conventional microbiological techniques, and since Dr. Savitri from um, LVP Hyderabad could not attend, I will also be covering her talk on the molecular diagnostic techniques. So very briefly on both the sections I'll be doing. So as we know, most of the eye infections are emergencies, which we, we need um, immediate um, confirmed diagnosis if possible, because most of them are very prolonged treatment. So we need very specific and appropriate treatment. And then we also know that uh, clinical signs are not very reliable. However, Dr. Revati just mentioned that in culture negative cases, clinical signs are very well correlated with the outcome. And some of the unique features we see living in a tropical area and and living in a developing country, we see a large number of fungal infections. So we cannot afford to empirically start antibiotics in most of our patients. And then other things is we see a lot of unusual organisms, like for example, microsporidium atypical, mixed infections. And if you want to understand the epidemiological trends, antibiotic sensitivities, these are some of the reasons you definitely need to do a microbiologic uh, workup. And then these are some of the data which I always um, uh, tell the, even the students who come to my lab. We should know some of these um, uh, in s statistics. Like in corneal ulcers, the culture positivity ranges from anywhere from 25 to 78%, depending on the institute or the area you're practicing in. Op ideally, I would say 50% culture positivity is a good lab. And in endophthalmitis, it is even lower. So although other EVS and all says 70%, it is practically speaking, it is only below 40% only is culture positive in endophthalmitis. However, we send the specimen however quick we do. And mixed infection is another point I really want to point out. You now, if you ha have a result which is a high rate of mixed infection, then you should really um, check, like what was the quantity, how did they report, especially if you get a lot of staphylococcus along with your fungus report. So the conventional methods is uh, direct microscopy, then other methods is molecular diagnostics. So I'll just skip these. So the most of the samples as clinicians, since the one unique point in ocular microbiology, sample collection is done by the ophthalmologist. 
unlike in other infectious disease. So the common samples are the scraping, ACTAP, vitreous, depending upon the area of infection. So the, the next two slides is one point which is really will be the take home message of uh, my talk today is doing a direct microscopic examination by ophthalmologist in the clinic itself as far as possible. So this is a very simple setup. Anybody can do this. Just you can have a microscope with a spatula or a blade, a small spirit lamp or any uh, heating thing, a cover slip, a KO solution and a gram stain set. So if this is available, a direct microscopy can easily be performed either by yourself or by your technician. It's very simple and the most important is you can get the results within a very brief time. So all for treatment you just have to know whether it's fungus or bacteria. So that's enough to start treatment and it's a very high sensitivity. Most of the studies have shown nearly 80% direct microscopy is sensitive to pick up some organism. Very, very inexpensive and easy to train. And another point is for especially for corneal ulcers, Direct inoculation is very, very important. So because unless you do a directly inoculate the specimen onto the culture plate, uh, then only you will have better recovery of organisms. And since we are dealing with a lot of fastidious organisms like pneumococcus. So many labs which don't report pneumococcus and they say we, for us pneumococcus is not there, that means they are not doing direct inoculation. So you should make sure all these steps are in place before you come out with the, the reports there. So this slide is just showing you the flow of how a specimen is dealt with. We do direct microscopy, basically gram stain, KOH, calcofloor if available, blood agar, chocolate, PDA, any other medias you want to add, molecular diagnostics. So this is just a flow chart. So I just wanted to share some pictures of direct microscopy of how the fungus uh, look like. I know just for clinicians to be uh, familiar, although in residency most of the institutes teach the residents how to do this, uh, you know, as we progress, then we might uh, lose track of this. So fungus is described as uh, broad, septate, filamentous, branching. This is how it looks on calcofloor, but you need a fluorescent microscope for this. And people who are not very used to seeing fungal filaments, this is a very, very e um, useful technique to have. And on KOH is the most easiest and best method to pick up fungal filaments. So you can see all the broad, septate, branching filaments. And some of the culture plates, uh, the how the bacteria looks like. So what I wanted to point out here is the report should always contain the quantification of organism and the day it grew. So the, in this way, you can rule out contamination. So for example, if the report tells you very heavy growth of staphylococcus along with fungus growing on the area of inoculation, that is wherever you have streaked the sea streak in. So this is how a, a proper culture should be. Like anything growing outside should not be reported. So I, because this point, the ophthalmologist should know. And they should be the ones, you know, educating the lab and asking them what was the quantity of growth, when did it grow, and did it grow on the area of the sea streak which I made. And echinthamoeba is another organism which general microbiologists don't see often. Only people working with eye infections, we really see it. Because obviously echinthamoeba is not there in a systemic infection. So it's, it's up to you all to really recognize how these cysts look like and differentiate it from other epithelial cells. Microsporidia is another organism, both uh, LVP and uh, we have also published. It's really now becoming um, endemic. It's not an epidemic or an outbreak anymore. We are seeing it throughout the year for the last five years. So the lab should be uh, prepared to recognize these microsporidia and what are the different stains to be used in uh, dealing with microsporidia. So this criteria should really be remembered if you want, uh, when we are reporting an organism, growth on two or more media, growth on one media and plus seeing it on the smear or heavy growth at the inoculation site. <coughs> okay, the next part of my talk is on the PCR. So molecular diagnostics, now everybody is very, very familiar. It's very easily available in most of the centers and even private labs offer PCR for many infections. Uh, it's easily available real time conventional PCR. So as clinicians using a molecular diagnostics, so what are the points that you all should be uh, remembering and knowing? So I just wanted to start off this, this talk will basically be just one case scenario I wanted to explain, which will really describe both the usefulness and the pitfalls of using a PCR. And then just very, very briefly molecular uh, tests and issues related and one slide on just what is next generation sequencing. So this was one case which I had presented to the UVA clinic um, a few years back. 
So this was a, a girl with tw 22 years defective vision for one month. And the U UVS specialist uh, had a diagnosis based on all the clinical features that it could be sarcoid or the B scan, whether it could be endogenous endophthalmitis. So they did a with AC tap and the AC fluid was positive for fungus. So the patient was started on antifungal uh, treatment, but unfortunately it didn't, she didn't respond and the infection progressed and ultimately it uh, developed a painful blind eye for which the eye was enucleated. And the enucleated eye was positive for MTB in everything. So this was a very unique case in which MTB grew uh, from the eye specimen, but the PCR was also positive. So what this uh, patient really highlights is, why was the PCR positive for fungus? So this really shows that P the main issue with PCR is a lot of false positives. And fungus and bacteria being ubiquitous can easily contaminate your PCR. So PCR is not a gold standard and it should be interpreted with caution. And we really have to have a very um, healthy uh, dialogue with the lab people before accepting any uh, results from them, especially with dealing with uh, PCR. But then however, the molecular diagnostics have really been useful in many situations, like in these two uh, case series which was published from our institute few years back, in which it helped in identifying this um, procyvarum varium as a new etiology of childhood uh, uh, uveitis. And then also in these outbreaks, many different viral uh, you uh, retinitis and uh, neuroretinitis. West Nile virus was established with the help of molecular diagnosis. So we know the reasons why do we want to use, especially in eye infections, because we know that there might be a lot of organisms which we cannot cultivate, unusual organisms, and the usefulness is uh, because the culture is, although it's specific, the sensitivity is very low, and the time takes much longer. So for all uh, all these reasons, PCR is definitely a uh, a very valuable and a useful tool. And in nowadays, in many situations, it's also considered as the gold standard, especially for ocular TB or in other uh, diseases. So advantages is um, it detects the presence of nucleic acid, so you don't have to have a live organism there. It's more sensitive than culture, and it's very useful where situations where you need a rapid diagnosis. And uh, just once, uh, this thing on what and all are the steps involved, so it's Basically, you have three different cy uh, cycles, DNA generation, hybridization, elongation, and then ultimately you can do a DNA sequencing to identify the species. And the conventional is uniplex, nested, multiplexed, but now the real time is only actually, it's much more useful than the conventional PCR. So real time PCR is also known as quantitative PCR, and it helps in differentiating between a past infection or an active current infection. So wherever possible, it's much better to have a real-time PCR. It's what I just mentioned, it's a quantitative PCR, and it differentiates from latent and active infection. So this is the most important point as clinicians, uh, which will be helpful in managing the patient and less chance of contamination. So finally, so what is the future? So the future is now the next generation sequencing uh, for a pathogen, especially for pathogen detection. Although next generation sequencing is a technology which is there for the past few years, and it has been proven very, very useful in many, especially genetic disorders, and, and, in, and sequencing all these unknown genes or the mutations in known genes, novel mutations. Whereas in clinical microbiology, it's really been predicted to change the way we are going to practice clinical microbiology. I mean, that's what the literature currently says because mainly it allows the detection of all foreign DNA or RNA. So we don't have to have a prior knowledge of what to look for. So you don't have to say sequence for bacteria, sequence for TB or P acne or whatever, because it's going to sequence all the DNA, and then you can either um, uh, compare it with a known database, <coughs> or if it's nothing is known, then you have to align all the sequences and predict what it could be. And especially useful for antibiotic resistance, and currently it is being used in many areas to analyze outbreaks. And in ophthalmology, the only two publications using next generation sequencing has come from um, UCSF. Uh, this is from UCSF and this is from um, University of Washington. So this paper is very interesting. So they have predicted rubella, they have detected rubella virus in a patient who had uveitis for more than 16 years. So then they concluded that this was an old rubella infection which was still persisting in that patient. 
So finally, issues to remember is because of the extreme high sensitivity, a lot, lot of false positives, high specificity, false negative, molecular diagnosis are not magical essays because this is what the clinicians will always ask us. Culture is also negative, PCR is also negative. So that's the uh, reality we have to face. And we have to remember it cannot differentiate between active and latent infection and uh, viable or non-viable. Thank you. Mm, we can have the questions at the end also since the next talk will be by Dr. Sujata Das, who is the director of L.V. Prasad Eye Institute from Bhuneshwar and also heads the Konya services. And she's actively involved in treating um, eye infections and has a lot of publications, especially in microsporidia keratitis. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Lalita, for including me. Uh, so I'll be speaking on how the microbiology lab, whatever experience you are in clinical side, you have to depend some time on microbiology. So I'll say that, tell about few case, case scenario, how your clinical knowledge experience may not help you in doing proper diagnosis. Uh, this 50 year old female presented to us with redness watering of 15 days duration. In the presentation, she was using all type of antibiotic, antifungal, antiviral, what is most commonly used by general practitioner. The clinical picture is like this. It's a dry raised infiltrate. It is slit lamp examination, few tentacle-like projection. It is a, like a Hirschfeld scraping. We did a corneal scraping whether you see in uh, all the patients undergo corneal scraping when they come. Uh, in KOA, that is like blood aseptate uh, um, fungus, uh, which is suggestive of IPM. So by this time, from this smear, microbiologists tell us of IPM. So basically, you know the treatment of IPM is different from other fungus. It's not like antifungal, and they don't respond to medical management most of the time. So similarly, from the culture, if you see the blood agar and chocolate agar, it normally does not grow in SDA. So the picture is a flat colony. Again, uh, uh, from the smear, microbiologists give us a clue that you have to plan for surgery. And the treatment is completely different. Nowadays, we treat with uh, uh, linozolid. Similarly, so this helps us, uh, this patient finally ex uh, worsened like this and underwent therapeutic keratoplasty. So this is about atypical organism. Uh, similarly, the another lady who, the last lady presented with a 15 days duration, this lady presented with one year and treated everywhere in the past with antiviral. So when she came to us, even I also started pre treating her as a, a viral treatment. I gave steroid and anti with antiviral cover. So finally, one day she landed up with like this, with a suppurative infiltrate. Initially, it was like a viral. With a thinning, I did a TAB cell. While doing TAB cell, I took corneal scraping, and it turned out to be microsporidia. I remember I went to Dr. Sabitri, no, this looks like fungus cannot be microsporidia. I did a repeat scraping, again repeat scraping turned out to be microsporidia. So again, you know microsporidia, stromal keratitis hardly responds to medical management. So we planned for a PK, and we did a, um, uh, like all half corneal button goes to microbiology and histopathology. So in this case, we reported uh, anterior chamber uh, microsporidia spore can penetrate desmond membrane, it goes to anterior chamber exudate. Uh, the third patient, uh, again, is a common organism but atypical presentation. If you see this picture, everybody will think it is acantamoeba. It's a typical ring infiltrate. Gives a uh, case of uveitis department. He had mebomitis. Uh, he was on secondary glaucoma. He was, present, uh, he, he was on steroid for longer duration. Similarly, we did a scraping. We got uh, gram positive organism, which is found to be uh, Staphylococcus species. And uh, sensitivity to only cefazolin and vancomycin. Again, uh, the patient was treated with cefazolin, but it was a refractory keratitis. It did not respond to a routine treatment. We did a therapeutic graft. So we have case scenario either uh, a typical organism where you are dependent on microbiology find finding or typical organism with a typical presentation. Similarly, this uh, patient, if you see, because of satellite lesion, you will think it is a fungus. And the patient is a non-contact lens wearer, only two days history. Of course, two days history, you don't think like fungus, but the clinical picture without history, you'll see, then it looks like a fungus. Uh, again, it turned out to be pseudomonas. So we published this uh, three cases in our BGO in uh, 2010. 
the another lady this is in the beginning around 2007 uh, in lvp bhubneshwar we saw this lady and uh, she had a history of one year and uh, she was on uh, systemic topical and systemic antifungal and uh, the central plaque was really raised dry looking and uh, again we had a suspicion of uh, fungus uh, so we got uh, we did a uh, scraping as well as keratectomy even ke i could not put the slides of keratectomy histopathology specimen both the things are suggestive of acantomida we did a keratectomy and for the final picture is this so she did not need a uh, graft so all these uh, scenarios say that uh, we definitely need microbiology it's not that uh, our clinical uh, acumen is so strong we will be known to uh, the known organism and uh, organism with uh, typical presentation so basically microbiology lab helps clinician in diagnosis as well as uh, treatment uh, uh, because the talk was anti segment i thought i'll cover conjunctivitis keratitis scleritis scleritis my next speaker will be speaking on uveitis so basically conjunctivitis uh, is uh, mostly bacterial viral nowadays i hardly see any uh, bacterial uh, conjunctivitis it's mostly a viral and mostly adenoviral and most of the time diagnosis is clinical however in a typical case if we don't get any um, uh, response by the treatment then we can think of doing a uh, uh, smear culture pcr or diagnostic chip uh, available which will detect adenovirus coming to keratitis the etiology may be bacteria fungus parasites and virus not only corneal scraping uh, will send to microbiology lab in, uh, definitely this is mandatory but other than corneal scraping if it does not respond then corneal biopsy is another alternative and corneal biopsy can go to histopathology also usually half go to culture and half go to histopathology because of the microbiology i have not put histopathology here similarly corneal tissue half corneal button also a publication of ours where we did not get organism during the initial treatment or sometime patient present with the perforation where there is no scope of scraping so definitely corneal tissue will help us for the diagnosis sometimes if it is not uh, you are not getting any organism for scraping is your self as a therapeutic as well as a diagnostic tool and uh, if you have a suture corneal tear getting infected or corneal tunnel where a suture is there or pk especially please send the suture and similarly contact lens uh, many time it happened the corneal scraping is negative but you get organism from contact lens and solution so this is the routine protocol we follow whenever the patient comes so both the both smears and uh, depending on the uh, amount of course available but if it's a sufficient amount we try to put in all the media uh, how the recommended protocol it is not that everybody does the um, corneal scraping for all cases although it is institute practice it, uh, we do for everybody ao 2013 preferred practice says that you need uh, for large central stromal melting ulcer you need both uh, culture as well as uh, stain uh, other is small peripheral also there is culture is optional however the uh, when the stain also is optional but you have to remember the scenario there we get mostly bacterial so they respond to bacterial uh, dr lalita has already covered the sensitivity the only thing i want to highlight the sensitivity for fungi is kos is very high so even if nobody uh, somebody does not have a culture facility we can go ahead with the kos at least and the result uh, this is a huge um, a microbial keratitis and similarly this uh, again this kos is 99.3% for fungi and 100% for nocardia and more than 90% for acantamoeba is uh, for fungi it is more than a gram stain smear so the conclusion the authors have told the kos smear is of greater diagnostic value in management of infective keratitis and it is recommended in all clinics without exception for establishing timely treatment if you go to culture this one uh, we did a prospective study in lvp bhubneshwar to uh, just to know the curiosity whether uh, fungus will grow in blood agar chocolate agar to our surprise this is more than sda even the time taken was less so if uh, the main out highlight is if you don't have access to so many media at least blood agar and chocolate agar can be used to rule out of course you can't identify um, but uh, even if you identify you don't have much treatment unless it is academic interest you can use blood agar and chocolate agar to rule out fungus um, role of fungal uh, role of pcr in fungal keratitis uh, this is from all india institute they took 40 presumed keratitis mycotic keratitis and pcr positive was 50% and culture was 25% so it is more than culture and the uh, sensitivity of pcr was 70% and kos is 60% and gram was 40% so 
So they concluded it is not only proved an effective rapid method for diagnosis of fungal keratitis, but is more sensitive than KOH weight mount and gram sphere. If you see the PCR role in Akantamur, this is Dr. Savitri's publication. Uh, the sensitivity is same as uh, smear and PCR. So PCR has no role basically in Akantamur keratitis according to this study. Uh, I think the, uh, even uh, the my first speaker, uh, Revati, told about why we get smear negative. Is it may be early disease where the infiltrate is small, or if it's a deep stromal infiltrate, or if patient is used prior use of antibiotics, so in those cases you have to discontinue antibiotic at least for two days. And sometimes it is non-infectious ulcer, or a new trainee who has done improper scraping, uh, this region of smear negative at this. I, so in those cases, you do re-scraping, at least in those cases where lack of clinical response and the patient is clinically worsening or culture negative specimen. So uh, like uh, Lalita told about mixed infection, you always keep in mind that if the patient is not responding to your treatment, maybe there's a mixed infection. So you can do uh, the uh, repeat treatment. Uh, in this study about prognosis of mixed bacterial keratitis, the basically those patients who are unresponsive to initial medical treatment, the possibility of mixed infection by bacteria and fungus should be considered. Uh, like I told uh, half corneal button, see this uh, patient, only the fungus is sitting near the desmid. Even if you do a biopsy, you will not get, and definitely smear is not going to helpful. In those cases, if you send half corneal button, you will get a clue what organism it is because it's more uh, important for the treatment purpose because you don't start steroid immediately. So this uh, paper we published in cornea dividing the association between culture result of corneal scraping, culture, and histopathology result. So all cases of histopathology and culture of corneal tissue, corneal scraping were not performed in four cases. So they, because they presented with four perforation. In six cases, corneal tissue were culture positive, but the corneal scraping was sterile. So there is a need for sending to, to both histopathology and microbiology. So this is the paper where I was telling about contact lens related microbial keratitis. So there is a need for sending contact lens or contact lens solution, uh, especially when the scraping is uh, not coming in and you suspect some organism you are not getting. So in this study, we included 50 eyes and it was 17 eyes, both corneal scraping and contact lens were culture positive. But, sorry, corneal scraping was positive in 17 eyes and contact lens was in 35 eyes. In 13 cases, both of them grew identical organism. And so contact lens culture may give a clue to organism involved in cases of microbial keratitis with negative corneal scraping and culture and may help in choosing appropriate antiviral therapy. So coming to scleritis, uh, either you send scleral scraping for smear culture and PCR or scleral biopsy or scleral buckle wherever scleral buckle is there. So it's main difficulty in dif uh, uh, differentiating clinically many, most of the time is bacterial, uh, it is uh, immunological or non-immunological. Many time you burn your finger, you start steroid and uh, patient come with this picture. Uh, in this study, we got most common organism is staphylococcus species, then uh, fungus followed by nocardia. Uh, the scleral buccal infection, again, the most common etiological agent is Staphylococcus uh, epidermidis, followed by mycobacteria and current bacterium. And uh, chloroquinolone is a most uh, common antibiotic used in these cases. The ciprofloxacin sensitivity was 100%. So, so this is a scleral buccal infection with gram-positive and pseudomonas infection. And I'm not going to detail of the PCR in UVA, it is because the next speaker will cover on that. So other than diagnosis, uh, microbiology lab will help you in uh, treatment. So basically, this diffusion method and uh, MICY uh, test and VITEC, it helps us to establish the train and guide antibiotic policy, provide guideline for effective treatment and di resistance to uh, direct uh, detect resistance and direct new drug formulation. All these tests are done, uh, like especially this diffusion test is done routinely. And most of the tests are for um, bacteria, not for fungi. Uh, the one is it is expensive and uh, e-test is expensive and fungi you do have limited options. So, uh, like Revati told, uh, based on the smear examination, we start our initial therapy. Either you continue that therapy or modify based on the culture and the clinical response. You can plan surgical approach. So in that case also we are dependent on the um, microbiology lab. And uh, E-test, uh, this is a study where they've done E-test uh, for uh, antifungal susceptibility. 
and they concluded it is a simple test with a uh, may provide referential information for clinical consideration of using antifungal agent to treat fungal keratitis. Uh, I'll not go to this uh, because already Lalita has described why do you use a PCR because it's not routinely used uh, in day-to-day -day practice. It's basically for viral infection. We already see has told about the multiplex PCR. Uh, this is uh, currently most probably not available, but it was available few years back for diagnosis of keratoconjunctivitis, EVitis, uh, retinitis, and endophthalmitis. Uh, all this uh, cheap were available. This. So basically to conclude, um, I'll say rapid diagnosis can be provided by initial examination of corneal scraping using various training techniques. Algorithm to treat based on initial laboratory report needed to be in place. And culture and molecular method can be used to confirm the result. This flowchart, uh, similar flowchart, uh, Repati had shown. How do you go about the uh, scraping? And uh, if it is smear positive, start antimicrobial medication. If it is negative, uh, I always feel you should do a repeat scraping. If you have access to confocal microscopy, go ahead with confocal microscopy or culture and PCR. Even if you are positive and it is not responding to treatment, then you think of uh, repeat scraping to rule out mixed organism. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sujata. Is there any questions for? Uh, um, I just wanted to ask uh, what is the uh, point of stain? Is that uh, lectin or? Uh, that is more um, lectin staining. Uh, no, sir. I don't. I'm not sure anybody does because it's, I think it's more time consuming. G for GMS stain is good. Lectin on what tissue you would do? Lectins are, uh, uh, I'm not aware of anybody doing it now. I think maybe the issue was with cost and the time also. It, it, yeah, it takes a lot of time to uh, do. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sujata. Our next speaker would be Dr. Uh, Vedana Aigi, who is a um, consultant at the UVA services at Arvindai Hospital, Madurai. And she works along with Dr. Ratnam, and obviously they see a lot of uh, infectious uveitis. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to cover about laboratory workup in infectious uveitis and endophthalmosis. First, I would like to thank Dr. Lalita for giving me this opportunity. Introducing uveitis and its workup. Actually, uveitis is more like a puzzle because a single disease can have various clinical manifestations. For example, tuberculosis can present with something as simple as recurrent episcleritis or something like a sclerokeratitis, choroidal granuloma, or occlusive vasculitis causing visual loss. And again, a similar presentation can be seen in varied clinical conditions. For example, the same scleritis which we discussed can also be seen in infectious conditions like leprosy, viral diseases, and sometimes in, and also in non-infectious autoimmune conditions. So looking at a single clinical presentation, we can't diagnose and treat a patient and give a complete result. So what we need is a complete ophthalmic and uh, systemic history, complete ophthalmic and uh, systemic evaluation, and a tailored lab diagnosis to come to a final diagnosis. So. How is the lab going to help us out? In an infectious uveitis, the laboratory workup helps to diagnose rapid enough to intervene with a specific therapy. But when a specific diagnosis could not be made, it helps us to start empiric therapy with sufficient ex expertise. But again, in non-infectious uveitis, it rules out infection faster and helps, to, helps us to start on corticosteroid therapy or immunomodulated therapy, helping us to treat the patient faster. In uveitis, few conditions are rapidly deteriorating. For example, acute retinal necrosis or bacterial endophthalmitis. If they are not accurately diagnosed faster and treated promptly, it can lead to visual loss. So in these patients, we need investigation. And few conditions are very slowly evolving. For example, fungal endophthalmitis or a toxoplasmic retinophoriditis, though they are slowly evolving, Unless we have an accurate diagnosis, when these patients are started on empiric corticosteroid without an antimicrobial cover, this can further worsen the existing 
clinical picture. I'll discuss a clinical scenario. This was actually a patient who was referred from a, uh, from a center to us. The patient was seen post cataract surgery, actually two to three weeks post cataract surgery. They referred us as the patient had pain, redness, and defective vision, and patient had hypopion on slit lamp examination. They thought the patient had endophthalmitis and referred to us for further evaluation. But is it actually endophthalmitis, just presence of pain, redness, defective vision, and just because there was a cataract surgery, should we think of endophthalmitis? We went ahead and we asked, we went again and asked a complete history. Patient said he had similar episodes of hypopion and uh, in, uh, redness even before cataract surgery, and he had similar presentation in the other eye also. When we further went ahead and did a systemic examination, he was a known patient of ankylosing spondylitis. His ultrasound for the posterior segment was absolutely normal, and his AC tap was negative for infection with PCR. So this is actually a case of HLA B27 anterior uveitis. Here, the infection is ruled out, and the patient can be promptly treated with further treatment, and we can get a good vision. So now we know why we need a laboratory investigation. Coming to the investigation, complete and a differential count. Though they don't give a particular diagnosis, they give a clue to the underlying clinical condition. Leukocytosis can be seen in bacterial infections. Relative lymphocytosis is seen in viral and tuberculosis. Increased eosinophils is seen in parasitic infection and also in sarcoidosis. Coming to ESR and CRT, again, ESR is not specific or not diagnostic of any particular disease, but this is increased in inflammation and acute and chronic infection and neoplasm. CRT, it actually increases rapidly in an active disease and return more quickly to normal. So in an acute condition, CRP does tell us how much of inflammation is there, but still ESR is a fairly reliable investigation to follow up the disease and monitor the response to the given therapy. Coming to the infest investigation for tuberculosis, we have MANTU and Quantiferon. MANTU actually measures the skin induration after the protein, purified protein deriv derivative is injected intradermally and the induration is spread 48 to 72 hours. While quantiferon measures the interferon gamma, it is a cytokine which is released in vitro in the patient's blood when they are exposed to TB antigen. MANTU is affected by BCG vaccination and other mycobacteria, while quantiferon is not. MANTU is less sensitive and specific, while quantiferon is more sensitive and specific, but MANTU is cheaper than quantiferon. But still, MANTU is being the first line of investigation in tuberculosis before going for a quantiferon. Still, MANTU or quantiferon cannot say whether the tuberculosis is active or a latent. Serological test for syphilis. Though we don't see syphilitic uveitis as a routine, as I told earlier, complete history is important in all the uveitic patients. And in India, at least, we don't have a complete personal history of a patient. So as a routine in our clinic, we do serological tests for syphilis for all the adult patients. It can be either a non-chepnimal test or a chepnimal test. Non-chepnimal tests of GDRL and RPR, they actually detect antibody to cardiolipid and it's suitable for screening and monitoring the patient. Well, chepnimal tests detect antibody against chepnimal antigen and it is suitable for confirmation and diagnosis. Actually, we had a patient who had a different clinical picture which was not related to syphilis, but his TPSA turned out to be positive. So as a routine, we referred him to his dermatologist or venerologist, and he wrote a letter. Uh, I still remember the words. He said, you can't diagnose a patient to have syphilis actively because TPSA is a serological scar. We don't treat patient for a serological scar. So TPSA and FTABS, once it is positive, it is going to stay positive for life, and you are not going to treat the patient for syphilis unless you are going to confirm it with a non trepanimal test. Anterior chamber paracentesis, the indications being endophthalmitis, infectious uveitis, and to rule out other masquerades. The limitations being very limited volume. We get only up to 0.2 ml, and this sample is not enough for all the investigations. And false negative when the infection is usually restricted to the posterior segment. The main indication is it's a very easy investigation. It's quick, and it can be done even uh, as an OP procedure. So always go for anterior cha chamber paracentesis if it is po possible before going for other invasive procedures. Uterus biopsy is done when we suspect intraocular infection, when the inflammation is not responding to therapy as we expect, or when the inflammation is restricted to the posterior segment. 
the sample is obtained by a vitreous cutter or its 23 gauge needle and it will be better if it is done by a highly skilled ophthalmologist or even better if it is done by a vitreo retinal surgeon we are supposed to collect 2 ml of undiluted vitreous for sampling the sample from anterior chamber tap and the vitreous biopsy goes for smear culture ptr analysis histopathology and cytology as madam has already discussed the smear is usually for grams koh and biel nelson if you are thinking of other organisms culture for bacteria fungus and other organisms we have we suspect ptr analysis when we want the result faster and also in fastidious organisms histopathology when you have granulomatous infections in mind and cytology to rule out masquerade when do we do diagnostic surgery always weigh the benefits against the risk before going for a diagnostic surgery when you really have a genuine diagnostic dilemma before treating the patient when there is no response to treatment as expected or you are already inside the eye and you can go and do go ahead and do a diagnostic surgery iris and ciliary body biopsy is usually done in case of suspected malignancy and very rarely when we have a infectious granuloma like in tuberculosis or leprosy or in an inflammatory granuloma like sarcoidosis choroidal biopsy it is done in patients who are already treated and they are not responding to a treatment the transleural or a transvitreal approach is taken the limitations being choroidal hemorrhage and retinal detachment retinal biopsy is done when the retina, uh, retinitis is atypical transvitreal approach is taken the junction of inflamed or a normal retina and the normal retina is selected because the periphery of inflamed retina is more likely to harbor organisms than the normal uh, than the center of the lesion again supranasal quadrant is selected because it is easy to protect the macula from retinal detachment and it is easy to tamponade the patient post operatively we will discuss few clinical scenario this is a patient this is not a picture of a patient who had recurrent hypopyon and he gave a very vague history of skin infection is in the past we went ahead but still he was not very forthcoming with the history and he was from a high socio economic status his posterior segment was absolutely quiet and there was no other clue towards his infection uh, condition so when we went ahead and did the ac tap actually he was positive for afb it was a case of mycobacterium leprae when the clinical when the history is not complete the clinical picture is not very sure we uh, the lab diagnosis complements and gives the complete diagnosis and helps to treat the patient faster coming to granulomatous uveitis actually this part is actually discussed by madam earlier few years down the lane in our department there were few kids from the same village who presented with anterior chamber granuloma few of these kids actually had subconjunctival granuloma and only one clue being these kids used to take bath in a river or a pond in the village and most of them were from the villages next to each other they were already treated with att outside and there was not much of response lots of investigations were done and it's not like just the click of the slide which gave the diagnosis a few years down the line they made out the histopathology showing a zonal inflammation of necrotized granuloma with a degenerated tegument and pcr was positive for trematode these kids were diagnosed to have an entity called river water granuloma which they got when they acquired a, uh, which they acquired because of a trematode while they took bath in pond the thing was we didn't have similar episode similar patients in in the past 2 3 years but this year again after the rainfall we are getting few patients and whenever you see such a clinical uh, presentation please think other than tuberculosis and there is an entity called river water granuloma so laboratory diagnosis help us to diagnose newer entities this is a patient which intermediate uveitis uniocular and the vitreous haze was so much we couldn't see what was there posteriorly but vitreous tap showed a positive for afb his uh, lg medium showed a yellow color buff and ptr confirmed that it was tuberculosis the patient was promptly started on att and him and his inflammation responded very very well so madam has already discussed so i am not going in detail just a few words about culture microbial culture remains the gold standard for diagnosis of many ocular infections the limitations being low yield and inability to detect certain organism and potential long delay so nowadays polymerase chain reaction is becoming the first line of investigation it's 
it is a powerful molecular biology technique it detects even fewer than 10 copies of pathogenic genome it is fast and useful in fastidious organism and quantitation of the pathogen and the microbial load is possible because of the quantitative pcr coming to the last slide in uvi it is gather the history define the primary location characterize the lesion examine outside the eye or go ahead and re-examine and re again uh, gather the history order tailored investigations because if you are don't know what you are looking for you may not get what you want and finally you will get a complete diagnosis and you can treat your patients better thank you thank you dr biswas do you would like to add any comments on that Because it was an infectious etiology, I didn't no. cover the lymphoma. No, you you yeah, yeah. Add the um, yeah. point. Yeah, so generally uh, uh, speaking, um, I mean, uh, laboratory confirmation is definitely needed. But we should also remember there are a lot of limitations. And most importantly, we should remember um, as clinicians how to, as I mentioned in the beginning, how best to use the lab. So if you're fortunate enough to be in an institute where there is in-house lab, then it's very easy to approach. But if you have to rely on labs which are outside, um, then it is even more important on your part to really communicate with the lab and really keep on talking to them, discussing with them. Uh, so that's really uh, the take home message which I think this instruction course. Any other concluding remarks, Professor Jata? You want to mention anything else? Dr. Biswas, just one question um, which I wanted to ask you because nowadays both all the UVS specialists uh, keep saying that uh, they're seeing a large number of these um, very, very rapidly progressing retinitis. Very young adult males, within 48 hours or within a week, the whole retina becomes necrosed. Which, which is not exactly as an acute retinal necrosis. So what could be the etiology in such a case and how do we lab people help in that? That's the problem for us in the lab because uh, we don't know what to look for. So since there are so many outbreaks in India, so in all these cases, there definitely be some history of past history of fever or definitely has to be there. Yeah, 
As far as um, my knowledge goes, I'm not very sure of any publication on anaerobic um, organisms very common in eye infections. At least anterior segment infection is not at all common. A posterior segment infection also, anaerobic, um, uh, I'm not, I don't think so. Because nobody routinely cultures, even in the Western world or anybody else, nobody even cultures routinely for anaerobic. Uh, assuming that it's not going to be there. So because anaerobic organisms getting into the vitreous is, Dr. Biswas, do you have any uh, comments on that? Anaerobic um, infections in the eyes? Sujata, do you all do anaerobic culture routinely? RCM also. I, I discussed this. But the problem is most of the organisms are facultatively anaerobic. Even Staphylococcus will grow anaerobically. And most of the gram positives also will grow. Only very, very fastidious anaerobic, like Clostridium or um, I don't know, some other uh, Flavibacterium or something. Yeah, yeah. I know one microbiologist from Proctor. She said she's been nearly for 30 years. She's working there as ocular microbiologist, and uh, in that she said only one or two cases she's ever ever seen. Like the same scenario she's, you mentioned. So there is a possibility, but um, I think it's very, very less. So as routinely to do anaerobic culture, I know Shankinetralia, um, Dr. Lilly will do, does it. They used to do it for a very long time. I don't know whether they're still continuing routinely as anaerobic culture for. No, no more than for um, uh, ulcers, for end of, uh, for vitreous, it is uh, anaerobic. Um. No, unless you do the whole anaerobic, as I said, Many organisms are facultative anaerobic. So unless you do your whole anaerobic workup and identify the species, then it's generally confirmed it's purely anaerobic. And you have to continue anaerobic incubation and anaerobic identification. You can do a Vitec also with anaerobic. Um, there is a card Vitec which detects anaerobic. That's an easy method to do. There's no more questions, then um, I think we, we finished a little bit early also. Thank you very much for all your patience hearing.